Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have uh, Jason McPhee, an engineer for the state of California, and John Cameron, development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation, author of Rewire, Rekill, and the forthcoming, or the soon to come, soon to be published, Aristocracy. Welcome to the show. Eight billion dollars for Trump's Space Force. Is that enough, or is that a total waste of money, John? Well, I, I would say uh, that it's both. You know, if, if they can get the government to only waste $8 billion on something, it would be a record. Um, you know, if they stuck to $8 billion and just uh, kept people happy with, you know, spending that money. But any time the, the government throws down an $8 billion card, it's soon followed by a $16 billion card, which is followed by a $32 billion card. And um, all the, all the experts that aren't part of the, even former members of the military industrial complex say that it's a, a waste. Um, you don't need to create a, a separate force for space that um, the Air Force has the expertise and the people and the command structure and everything. So if you're going to extend um, our military might into space, why not simply make an extension of the Air Force? And, and I would say, um, you know, give peace a chance. Well, um, I mean, the, the Air Force itself was in the, it was the Army Air Force. Was the up Army until, up and, until World yeah, War up yeah. until the end of World War and II. World War II, and there was there was a um, a huge fight uh, to keep you know basically the Air Force a part of the Army, the Army Air Corps, and um, the Air Force won the battle. Said that they have a different mission, and the Army didn't understand the technology and didn't understand the and was the really, future. It was war. a lot simpler when it was the Department of War. Well, I think I think we should change uh, lots of names. Uh, instead of government employee, it should be civil servant or servant of the people. You know, and I think uh, Department of you're Defense. Living in a, you are definitely living in a fantasy world. In a world, fantasy right? world. Well, when did the servants become the masters? That's what I want to know. But on this, um, you know, do do if we're going to have this national presence and piss the whole world off constantly, do we need to be looking at? Um, at least being able to defend ourselves from space-borne warfare, especially, um, you know, we depend on, on um, GPS, and GPS depends on, depends on satellites. And if those satellites were knocked out, then all of the things that, that the current military uses rely on GPS. There used to be a very cheap... Um, is it short range or long range? I don't know. The, I don't know what kind of engineering you do, but um, there used to be a basically a regular radio system that they they the U.S. decided to defund that cost thirty million dollars. That was a good backup, and they don't operate that anymore. So, if everything we do requires precise GPS calculations, like for for missiles and for uh, location and everything, then probably makes sense to defend those satellites. Um, and without GPS, my watch wouldn't tell me what, how long it's going to take me to drive home as soon as I get in the car. Mm. That's terrible. You'd yeah. actually, have to, actually have to use your math brain. And, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It, you know, there, there is an issue with it being a commons up in space and the fact that there's all this junk and everything mm -hmm. else. But, but these are issues that the Air Force was already, I, I believe, dealing with. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of like an $8 billion distraction is what it really sounds like. You know, it's, it's It sounds to me like more like a turf building exercise. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you have uh, a separate command, then you have the ability to build a separate management structure, a separate uh, uh, track to getting four-star general stripes, uh, and so forth. I mean, it's, it's basically a way to increase the bureaucracy a, a, a uh, in ticket, the military. Yeah, a ticket to astronomical spending. <laughs> well, and, and, yeah, and then you can go ask for funding, and you can, uh, since most politicians, um, you know, have the, the uh, science education of a second grader, um, you know, it's very easy to, like, kind of, space, $8 billion, please, and they go, okay. So, um, yeah, you're right, it's a, it's a boondoggle. Does it mean, you know, if, if we're, we're going to be in, you know, we're in a trade war with basically the greatest technological power on the planet, China, right now, um, and so, it might be nice to, you know, actually look at defending things that we need in space, but does it take a, a, a space force? Um, no, and I think that uh, anybody who believes that it does is a space cadet. Best strategies for preventing and managing wildfires. We've had a couple of those this year. I, I had the uh, distinct uh, pleasure of driving 
up I-5 to Ashland uh, uh, last week, and mm -hmm. I drove through smoke the entire distance. Uh, the one bright side is that the uh, smoke in Oregon and Ashland was a little bit worse than it is in the Central Valley. It's a narrower valley. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, do, you know, we, we definitely have a lot of uh, fires burning mm -hmm. out there this year. Is, is there, uh, is there a, uh, a man-made reason for that, or is this just the nature taking care of its underbrush? This would be a man-created problem, pure and simple. When John Muir walked through the Sierra, whenever he walked through the Sierra and discovered all these things, he um, talked about the Sierra's inviting openness. And the reason the Sierra was invitingly open is because the ecosystem was in balance. Uh, one of the necessary parts of it is fire. And um, I guess in the early 1900s, um, there's all this national forest land and more and more and more forests nationalized. And there was an active and still is um, a plan in place which is being prevented from um, being used by some Endangered Species Act and many lawsuits by green organizations like Sierra Club and Environmental Defense Fund and all the rest of that. So um, you either actively manage the forest as was planned, which means man-made thinning of fuel on the ground, or which means mean harvesting the timber. Harvesting the timber. And right. that's the way it was planned. National forests were supposed to be mined, fished, uh, pastured, and, and timber. They were supposed to be uh, a producing asset. Right now, those forests aren't being allowed to produce. Which is, um, which is and, and the underlying problem is that they were... Uh, a commons was created by making them uh, and, or being owned by the government and being owned by individual uh, entrepreneurial capitalistic landowners who would in fact timber or fish make make fishing available or do all you know do it mine all of the other productive uses of the land. And, and if you look at if you take a map of, of private forest lands and government forest lands and look at it from above at where the fires are and the the intensity of the fires and the destruction caused afterwards, you can look at the greatest uh, intensity of fires and the greatest destruction in the national forests and in the private lands very, very seldom, unless the private lands are, are being prevented from being carefully managed by professional foresters because of uh, the Endangered Species Act, i.e. the um, spotted owl and things like that, you will see that the lands that are not in the commons are much better off. You mean there's a correlation between public ownership and, uh, and out of control wildfires? You betcha. And even on the private lands um, where uh, lawsuits prevent, it, it's, it's even worse than you think. For example, I have it on good authority that um, you remember, I think you've probably seen pictures of uh, firefighters uh, fighting these blazes and they, they put down a, a, um, a fire line. They take bulldozers out and scrape soil away. They scrape away fuel and, and this is supposed to prevent the advancement of the fire. Well, what, in its infinite wisdom, what, um, what the national firefighting organizations are doing is is drawing those fire lines not near the blaze but a few miles back from the blaze so that uh, all the big wigs from all of the uh, federal government agencies can fly in stay two or three miles away from the fire collect danger pay <laughs> time and a half stay in nice hotels and um, and then there's consultants who would be there and all the rest of that Whereas the, the state folks, bless their heart, and I'm not a big fan of Cal Fire because they've done an awful lot of things wrong. They're up there trying to fight the fire. So it's, it's, uh, it's you know, basically corruption added to mismanagement. And, then, and, and it's big yeah. business fighting fires. I mean, I, oh, it's huge business, driving yeah. back from Ashland, I saw a, a, a virtual caravan of trucks, semi-trucks, mm -hmm. all of whom had the same, uh, the same sign on the door, which was catering. It was mm -hmm. a catering company. Mm -hmm. I think it was, I forget the name of the company, mm -hmm. you know, Richie's Catering for uh, Firefighters. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a company uh, that's making a heck of a lot of money just feeding the firefighters, not to mention all of the other supplies that they uh, are going through. Well, so, it, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a huge uh, industry fighting fires, and if you don't have a fire, then that industry uh, yeah. doesn't make as much money. I know a guy who makes his living almost completely from, he's got a mobile t-shirt printing press. 
<laughs> and he appears at uh, these fires and sells these um, T-shirts with the name of the fire and some, you know, bright imagery and all the rest of that. Like I survived the Marvel Cone Fire, or whatever, to firefighters and. Uh, Makes a good living from doing that. What's yeah. funny too, I, you know, when you talk about it being an industry, I remember uh, there being a, a case about ten years ago or so where one of those big uh, wildfires in uh, in the southern states happened, and I think it was one of the reserve forest firefighters who started it in order to <laughs> to be able to be called in to fight it. Well, one of the other interesting things talking about firefighters is a lot of the firefighters are prisoners yeah. who are being paid a couple three dollars a day to fight fires. And, and if they are released from prison, they are ineligible to be a professional right. firefighters because of the... Because uh, the, they uh, have a felony conviction. The felony conviction yeah. and the licensing laws and all the, all the rest of the uh, job prevention uh, techniques that government uses to keep uh, felons, felons and uh, under the uh, care and guidance of the state of California. What is that the increase in, in uh, jobs that require licensing is uh, threefold over the last 20 years? Something I'm not like sure that. what the percentage is. And it's is a are. huge yeah. chunk of, of it's mostly everyday blue collar, jobs. It's mostly blue collar jobs. Yeah. yeah. Um, what about government subsidies for, the, for rebuilding after fires? Well, and that's a, a big problem as well, and, and we see this with a similar case with FEMA when there's a flood and they subsidize the, the insurance for the people who live in those flood zones. It's the same thing with the, uh, the fires. You know, you have people living in areas that are hard to defend and they're uh, at a high risk, but they're not facing the market price of that risk. And so that, that uh, because government is coming in oftentimes and either subsidizing the insurance or uh, covering people's losses after the fact. And so this is uh, one of these problems where, you know, if we allowed the market to function and people to face the true price of their decisions, people may decide it's too expensive to live out there, but because they're shielded and the market's distorted, people are, are putting their resources mm -hmm. in the wrong places. New Orleans. Yeah, New Orleans yeah. is basically underwater except for some uh, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Hills. Weak, um, some, some very weak structures Levies in place to, yeah. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and moving on, this is uh, uh, still a mountain state, but I don't think there's any fires in Colorado, at least not, nothing I'm aware of. But mm -hmm. there, there is a, uh, a, an inferno going on with the, uh, again, Masterpiece Cake Shop. It's in trouble once again with the Colorado Civil Rights Division, this time for refusing to bake a cake, this time not for a gay couple, but for a person who is uh, celebrating their sexual transition birthday. Uh, they're saying, we don't believe in this, it's against our religion, we won't make the cake. C Colorado Civil Rights Commission, of course, is saying, aha, another chance to get these uh, miscreants. And this is kind of a sad uh, issue again because, you know, it certainly seems like, uh, you know, you, the, your first knee-jerk reaction is to say, well, gosh, these people just want a cake, why can't, uh, you know, somebody bake them a cake? But, you know, the, the problem is with these types of things is that, you know, the market will uh, a lot of times accomplish these things by itself. Um, if somebody decides... Well, I, I, I bet you a dime to a dozen, that, uh, there, a dime to a dollar, that there are dozens of uh, cake shops that would be more than happy to take Baker's the money. Baker's dozens. Exactly, yes. Right. Baker's dozens, yes. And, and that's just it. I mean, you know, you can go back and probably the, the, the best case of, of a parallel story on this is if you look at Jackie Robinson and, and going into baseball and... You know, one team decided that this guy was, uh, you know, had a talent level. That why should we discriminate and not include him on our roster? And so they include him on the roster, and they start winning games. And then eventually the competitors see, hey, wait a second, why is that guy, uh, you know, eating our lunch for us, essentially? And so uh, they decide to also adopt the uh, strategies of their competitors, and it gets rid of irrational bias, essentially. And so, uh, you know, to, if we just let uh, the market function, a lot of these cake shops will get bad publicity. They will, you know, who, who want to discriminate in a in a um, irrational bias, and and they'll just simply suffer uh, from market regulation by itself. I want to I want to take an opposite take on that. The the man master uh, piece uh, cake shop. He's an artist, and he his medium is cakes. And um, if he were a painter and uh, someone asked him to do a, um, a portrait 
of uh, someone on their sex transition birthday, then uh, I believe that, that uh, his First Amendment rights to uh, choose his own artistic expression would um, make him pretty much uh, bulletproof on something like this. But well, that, because that is... this uh, man chooses to bake a cake uh, for his artistry, and his cakes are artistic, they are, they are renowned, they're beautiful works of art, and he had, you know, he had until this, he had a number of people working for him. He was making a very good living. And, and he has uh, some core uh, moral beliefs about what kind of art he was willing to produce. And he chooses not to produce this kind of art. So if you were to say to, for example, um, who painted the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel? Michelangelo. Michelangelo. Uh, Michelangelo. So imagine uh, telling Michelangelo, no. Those Catholics, they're bad. You can't um, put that on the on the ceiling of the cathedral. You can, can however, um, put Wicca up there. Um, what would people think? And so I'm, you know, there, like like Richard said, there. If if the person just wanted a cake made, lots of people would make them a cake. What well, they yeah. don't just want a cake made. What they want to do is force this poor poor individual to violate his moral principles and create art for them that he does not want to produce. Just because it's cake doesn't mean it isn't art. Yeah, I mean, the Supreme Court decided in the Masterpiece Cake Shop, the original case yeah. uh, about the gay wedding cake, they said, uh, on First Amendment grounds, if I remember right, they mm -hmm. said, made the argument that you're making is what the Supreme Court uh, decided. Mm -hmm. But you've also got another, um, another part of the First Amendment, which is the right of association, the free, mm -hmm. you know, freedom to associate. And there is nothing about forcing somebody to do something, you know, to associate with or create product for somebody whose lifestyle they disapprove of, mm -hmm. that's a violation of the association clause. Well, sure, and, and should we even need the that, that didn't even, yeah. that, I don't, I'm not sure that was even addressed in the Supreme Court argument, but it should have been. I don't yeah. remember, but, but yeah. Do we even need the government then to parse for us what's well, art no, and what no. isn't? I mean, and I think, if you yeah. take a look at what has happened in the uh, liberalization of people's attitudes toward race, towards uh, gays towards the LBGTQ uh, community, all of that has happened before government got involved. All of those things happened and government followed. It's, mm -hmm. it's like the, the people who are in government say, I must hurry and catch up with the crowd because I am their leader. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and you saw this with, I believe, Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton coming out there for gay weddings after they're, you know, after, allowed in yeah, after it's a fa <laughs> after it's a fa Bravely family. stepping, you know, in front of the parade. <laughs> Libertarians, however, have been in favor of gay rights and all the rest. Exactly. Since our original candidate, John Hospers, who was the first openly gay presidential candidate at a time when living a gay lifestyle was, in fact, uh, criminal. Uh, Elon Musk has tweeted that uh, he has, or did and about tweet. about another future did criminal tweet. right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> did tweet. Uh, he, he announced through, a, through Twitter that he had secured funding to take Tesla private. That's prompting an SEC investigation. Why would that be, John? Well, because the SEC is a bunch of busy, busybodies, and, well, and they, they have uh, lots of rules, some of which are impossible to discern, which is why most people who go get in fights with the SEC settle out of court, because they can interpret their rules however they want. Um, and, and I think they're looking at him for basically manipulating the market. You're not supposed to make uh, announcements um, about um, things that will affect the price of a publicly held stock until the, the public, you know, basically everyone needs to get this information and it has to be true. Um, and, and, you know, basically this is the same thing as a, as a short seller planting rumors about a about a uh, problem with a lab somewhere. You know, I hear that they're having problems with their XYZ antiviral compound. It sounds like part of a book. Um, and so, in essence, the SEC is looking at it as market manipulation. Um, and it, it very well could be. Um, and the funny thing is, is that um, I'm not sure the, the, um, the laws in the, the rest of the world, but we have, um, super stringent financial reporting regulations in the United States and rules about 
you know, uh, what is insider information and who can trade on it and all the rest of that. And for years, and again, I'm not up to date on the laws, I haven't had time to do the research recently, this put people in foreign markets at an advantage to the United States because, um, you know, insider trading is, for example, in the Hong Kong market years ago, was a way of life. You know, if you knew something, um, you know, that you discovered that was a secret and you, and you used that information to, for a financial gain, it was okay. Um, and, you know, in, in the States, uh, they're, they're looking at them thinking that, you know, basically tweeting this, um, sending this knowledge out to the public and affecting the stock was, was either an inadvertent or a planned manipulation of the price of the stock. And it very well could have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, looking at the history of Tesla, this is a company that is that has a sky high stock price, all of mostly because uh, Elon Musk has the persona that drives it. It's it's like it's like Delorean that, that, that succeeded. Uh, he's, well, Delorean had an income stream though. He was selling uh, yeah, and, and so, yeah. <laughs> Tesla has never turned a profit for a full year in its entire existence, despite having massive subsidies from the federal government for. Uh, for the uh, electronic technology that it uses. Build a nice car. And it's, but it, you know, I've, uh, I've heard that the cars are nice. I've mm -hmm. uh, actually had a ride in one. It mm -hmm. seemed to be a fine car. But, uh, but I mean, the thing is, GM makes electric cars, Ford makes electric mm -hmm. cars, BMW makes electric cars, Saab makes electric I don't think there's any major car maker around that doesn't make electric cars. And all of those companies have actual car making experience. Mm -hmm. Tesla's problem is they have a good, a good product, but they can't turn them out. They can't, they, they can't get their factory production up to up high enough to meet actual market demand. Mm -hmm. Something wrong with, with you know, the operational uh, aspects of Tesla, which, well, is, I mean, the, which if, is one reason he's yeah. had to raise money hand over fist with new stock offerings and with new uh, debt issues uh, mm -hmm. from the, from the get-go and continuing to the present day. And I have a feeling that the market is starting to get a little bit anxious that he may never ever be able to fulfill the profit, the promise of the, of the sky high Tesla stock price and people are getting a little bit antsy. This might be his last hurrah to try to keep things going for another, another market cycle. Well, it's funny too when you talk about you know uh, sky high. Uh, it, it reminds me of one of the gimmicks they pulled in the past which was to put a Tesla on a rocket and send it out into space. I, I believe they did. And, and maybe one of those gimmicks that might help him get out of this is if he stamped, you know, Space Force One on <laughs> as the new model of the car. Space uh, Force One re recon vehicle. There you yes. go. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we'll we'll watch very carefully how the uh, the Tesla story plays out. It should be it should be good theater if nothing else. Uh, a recent report came out, I forget who, oh, I think it was, it was uh, published in USA Today. It was a story uh, listing the 20 cities in the country where the cost, of a, uh, the, the cost of a home was out of reach for the average middle income person. On that list were, of, of 20, eight of the cities are in California and very close to the, well, San Francisco, of course, was at the top. But also on the list, Sacramento, and can you believe Riverside and Stockton? What is going on that Stockton has houses out of reach of the average middle class family? I'm, uh, Jason's going to answer the question, I think, but I'm just biting my tongue. I, I, there's so many one-liners coming to mind. A tent can't cost that much, comes to mind. Uh, um, grass huts are selling for that much. No, I'm sorry. There's some beautiful areas in Stockton. Go ahead. Well, it's, it's funny because uh, yeah, obviously the, the two worst are if you're looking in San Jose and, and, and San Francisco, as you mentioned, and you're talking about an average of about a million dollars a home. So, you know, it's, uh, but in Sacramento, you're talking something closer to 400,000 or the high threes. High three, 90s, so, 380, something like that. Which yeah. has gone down 5,000 from last year from, from, from what I understand. It's actually, it uh, looks like it might be peaking. Who knows? Yeah. But I guess this is, uh, you know, part of the issue where we, we I guess we, we keep having these uh, distortive policies, whether it be, you know, restrictions on building, uh, building code, especially in some of these places that have the ultra high prices, uh, um, you know, just, uh, you know, people decide they don't like the look of something in their neighborhood. Um, and uh, so just all sorts of, uh, you know, there's the uh, 
yeah, I guess there's the small home people too, you know, who want to build these smaller units, and you know, the government says that the square footage has to be a certain amount of space. So there's there's just all kinds of um, distortions going on anywhere. But I mean, all this too, back from you know, the government constantly trying to distort the market by uh, you know guaranteeing loans and, and stuff, which was back from the days of the big economic bust that we had as well. So and, and before, I mean, yeah. So you're talking about really two uh, government-inspired forces that are conspiring to raise prices of homes. One is regulatory uh, constrictions. You can probably talk about how much it costs, $100,000, $200,000 to build a home before you even uh, lay the foundation and, and permitting fees and so well, forth. Well, de depending on where you are, and then, uh, you know, there's a, a case that actually Pacific Legal Foundation was part of where, where uh, in the L.A. area, um, mm -hmm. somebody bought a couple of lots, combined them, and wanted to put up what was for that area relatively affordable uh, condos. I think it was an eight-unit development. And they were going to be about a million bucks, but um, in that area, that was relatively affordable. And so the the rocket scientists uh, in the area said, "Oh yeah, you can do that, but we want you to 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 we want to make housing affordable. So we want to add a uh, hundred thousand or two hundred thousand dollars per unit to the cost of your product, so that we can build affordable housing somewhere else." So they've turned relatively affordable into unaffordable and took all the profit out of the development. And this happens over and over and over again. Then when you add on art fees, like in the, the uh, in city Oakland. of Oakland and other places, and um, you know the requirements for green space and what you talked about, uh, requiring homes to be of a certain size, requiring um, so homes to be shorter, shorter than, than people would normally build. Because you can build up and down on the footprint. But if your neighbors decide that building up is bad, because then I can't see the condors, oh wait, there are no more of those because of windmills that I like, uh, that produce electricity that are government subsidized. I could go but on yeah, for hours. I mean, you, you can so, go on, yeah. on and on on the yeah. supply side, but there's yeah. also a demand side problem which is caused by, uh, what, 20, 30 years now of cheap money, making mm -hmm. mortgages Been less cheap every more day, though. cheap than they should be. Yeah. Uh, interest rates are artificially low, making mm -hmm. it seem like it's a good idea to borrow money to buy a, a house when in fact uh, it's just contributing to the to the bubble from uh, from the demand side. I so, think all the studies indicate together. you should probably rent and put your money in a well-managed mutual fund and you're better off when you turn financially anyway. Could very well be. I, uh, I, won't, I won't make a guess on that. That's the show for this week. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, Libertarian Counterpoint on the uh, TV at Channel 17 in Sacramento, cable channels all over the place, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the web at www.accesssacramento.org at 8 p.m. Thursday, noon, Friday, and 4 a.m. Saturday. That's Pacific. my favorite time. 4 a.m. I get up early. Yes, I know you do.